join with Ken and JD and welcome everybody and expressing my appreciation for JD's message and the point he made toward the end of it is one that I became aware of a long time ago. And that area that he's talking about gets not enough study. But when you start into it, there is a wealth of information that's beyond what you might think until you decide to get into it. And it's there, but we have lived in a secular age for a good long time. And a great many religions that depend upon the Bible really haven't given the attention to it as being the plenary verbally inspired word of God. And thus they haven't many times dwelt upon the very things that he talked about that prove the plenary verbal inspiration of the scripture. So we appreciate that. And I would urge anybody to uh, spend time studying those things to give one encouragement and strength to know the Bible we have is the very word of God. Now we're studying in first Peter and we got down to first Peter two and about verse six. What I want to emphasize here are a couple of things that I really should have uh, brought out earlier. I got to thinking about it and realized that uh, I may have left a thought that I didn't want to leave with you. When I was mentioning that Peter, the writer, of course, of this, as far as the human hand that set it down, the Holy Spirit, of course, wrote the Bible, God did. But I said he's the apostle to the Jews. Well, that he was, as Paul was the apostle Gentiles. But I didn't want to leave anybody with the idea that because he was the apostle to the Jews, he had no authority whatsoever to be an apostle to non-Jews, any more than Paul being apostle to the Gentiles was limited to simply being the apostle to all non-Jews. So I want to emphasize that point. Uh, in the area of Asia Minor, where all these uh, places that are mentioned in verse 1, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia were located, what is modern-day Turkey, of course there were all Gentiles. There were Gentiles in these churches. And another point that comes out here that maybe I should have emphasized earlier as we enter into the study of this letter is that what this letter shows us in the terminology that Peter uses is that those people to understand the gospel of Christ and the development of how God would save man down through time had to be fully aware of the Old Testament scriptures and the place that the Israelites had in the unfolding of those uh, of, of the scheme of redemption. So many times, and that's true with the book of Revelation, but many times they used Old Testament terminology to present New Testament ideas. So when you come into the book of First Peter, then you have a letter written to Christians who are suffering. And certainly, even as the writer of Hebrews and as James uh, wrote, they were primarily working among Jews. They would be working with Gentiles, if nothing else, proselytes, who were converted as the Jews were converted to Christ by the gospel. But you must remember that the gospel, as the first century went on, began to have greater appeal to the Gentiles. Now, who took the gospel to that whole area of Asia originally? Well, when you read the book of Acts, you read of that work done by Paul and his companion. So there were a lot of Gentiles to that whole area. This tells us how it is that the, I've said many times, the gospel or the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So in preaching in the first century, as they start with the Jews, who were very familiar with the Old Testament, then they would lay down the various things pertaining to the prophecies of the Christ and show the fulfillment of those prophecies in uh, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, having said that, notice as you come, even as you um, 
as you leave chapter one, you'll notice that uh, he refers to Isaiah. And he quotes Isaiah in verse 24. For all flesh is grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower thereof falleth away, and so on. Well, again, uh, you see that brought out in verse uh, uh, chapter 40, verse 8, in verse 25. Uh, that's Isaiah 40, verse 8. But the word of the Lord endure forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Well, of course, it's interesting view of our lesson from J.D. tonight that we have that first sentence in verse 25, and the word of the Lord endureth forever. Uh, but nevertheless, that was all anchored back in Isaiah, who is the Messianic prophet. Why is he called that? Well, he referred to Jesus so much. Well, this meant that Peter and the others of the first century, and you can see it in Paul's writings too, but especially here in, in 1 Peter, that they emphasize that the church of our Lord is spiritual Israel. So they would use the terminology of the Old Testament referring to fleshly Israel to now say, no, it doesn't belong to the Jews as a fleshly people nowadays. It belongs to the church. The church is spiritual Israel. You are spiritual Israelites. You are God's people now, not the Jews. That's very important. Because even to this present day, and I'm quite sure even to the future, there exists that the Jews as a fleshly people are still God's chosen people. Uh, I found it very interesting to learn today that uh, former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee has been selected by um, Trump to be the ambassador to, to Israel. But I find that interesting because He's a Baptist preacher, and that's what he was doing before he got in politics and ran for governor in Arkansas. Well, I can tell you what he believed. He believes Jews, Israel in particular, are still God's chosen people, just like they were in the days of Moses and so on. Now, that'll make a difference about a lot of things, whether you think so or not, but it will. Now, Therefore, we need to know, it needs to be emphasized to each one of us, especially when you're enduring persecution. Now, we heard about some of that from J.D. a while ago, where he, where he got the material concerning the death of the apostles. I didn't get it from the Bible, but it comes from secular sources. And tradition had uh, that these people died in that way, save for Paul and, and uh, so on. We have closer to his death mentioned in the Bible uh, than we do the others. But nevertheless, this is what Peter say. Peter himself, who would die because he was a Christian, doing the work that God, through Christ, called him to do as an apostle of Christ. So they need the message of chapter one. What is it? You need to know you never were meant to live in the flesh on this earth in the first place. Jesus had already taught that uh, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. They were being plainly taught that in this world, you have tribulation. The Lord taught that himself. So you need to bear up under it. You need to know it's passing. These things will pass away. And they will make your faith stronger. That's what he does in chapter one. He's emphasizing how their, their faith is under trial. And when it goes through that trial of fire, it makes their confidence, trust, and belief in God and Christ and all things of the New Testament system stronger. That's the way we're made stronger. I don't know sometimes how, whether we're thinking about it, but when we pray to God to be stronger Christians, are we realizing how many times, if not all the time, to one extent or the other, that comes? So this world's perfect to get us ready for heaven and that involves trials and tribulations, and that we must bear up under it. Now, that's what you've got in the first chapter. Now, when you move into chapter two, as we already have, but we mention these things again, you'll see that there are several places where he quotes from the Messianic prophet Isaiah. But it begins, as we pointed out last week, in verse one of chapter two, with wherefore. That is, in the line of the facts I just told you. We can say it today though there were no chapters and verses in the letter where it was written. But we can say today, 
in view of what Peter wrote to us in the first chapter, then here's what you need to do. And he says, lay aside all malice and all guile. In other words, quit living like the world. It's, it's passing away. And the lust thereof. It's not going to abide forever. If you want to abide forever, then you must believe in Christ. And the only source of that belief is the word of God, the seed of the kingdom, Romans 10, verse 17, Luke 8, 11. So what should you cultivate? Well, you should want to know the truth as newborn babes desire their necessary milk. And all you have to do is be around a newborn babe to see when it wants fed, it wants it then, and it will not wait. Christians ought to be that way toward their knowledge of the Bible, because that's how you increase your faith. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And we walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. Well, these people walking by faith and not by sight in those days, whether Jewish Christians or Gentile Christians or Christians anytime, they were then to walk according to the word of God. They were to desire it. So he moves on, and now we get closer into where we were. But verses 4, 5, and 6 are all quotations from the book of Isaiah. This tells us even further how much the Old Testament scriptures that dealt with Christ were referred to. Peter would have known that these brethren, though they are under the authority of Christ in the New Testament, a part of which he is writing in this first letter, that the Old Testament was revealed in the New Testament. Remember the Ethiopian eunuch to Philip, he said, I don't know these things unless somebody can guide me to know them. And he began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Well, that's what you do. In reality, you could take any passage in the Old Testament in its context and begin there and arrive at Jesus Christ. That's what it's designed to do, the schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ. Galatians 3 and verse 24. So verses 4, 5, and 6 of chapter 2 all come uh, from Psalm 118.22 and Isaiah 61.6, Isaiah 28 and verse uh, 16, and Isaiah 8.14, Isaiah 62.12. Just notice how much he quotes from the Old Testament, especially Isaiah. So we come to verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture. In the Scripture. In the Scripture. What Scripture? Why, it's the Old Testament scripture that I just noted, Isaiah 28 and verse 16. So he's quoting the Old Testament. Now, what does that say when inspiration has an apostle of Christ writing to the church of our Lord, or the churches of the Lord, that Isaiah was writing what? He was writing scripture. They recognized the book of Isaiah as the word of God and thus fulfilled in Christ. So wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. <clears throat> so this is saying, hold the God's unchanging hand, as the song says today. How do we do that? We're faithful to Jesus Christ through thick and thin, good times and bad times. Even as John said in Revelation, actually the Lord speaking, Revelation 2.10, be thou faithful unto death, and you'll receive a crown of life. Let me emphasize again. He doesn't say, be thou faithful till you grow old and die in bed in a peaceful way or whatever. A natural death we might call it. He's talking about being persecuted, even as Peter's warning these brethren, being persecuted at the point of being put to death. Unto means be thou faithful unto a given end. How far should we be faithful in this life? Even if it costs you your physical life, you be faithful. That's what Peter's saying. You could actually take Revelation 2.10 and say it's a commentary on the whole of 1 Peter. Because that's what Peter is doing. 
And here, after he's mentioned all of that in the first chapters, we have it. He's reminding them that of what no doubt they had heard many times because he's quoting Isaiah and he had quoted the Psalms also earlier. So regardless of what men do regarding Christ, it doesn't change a thing about who Christ is and what he does and the power that he has. Now we can hold to him or we can reject him. doesn't change a thing about who Christ is. He's still going to bring everybody into judgment with every secret thing. And we all still must stand before him to judge what's seated Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. So you can say, I don't believe in Christ. You can say Christ didn't exist. You can say what you want to about him. That's false. That is contrary to what the Bible says. It won't change a thing. He is what he is, and he is what the Bible declares him to be. I can accept that or reject it but he's still who he is. Then he says in verse 7, unto you, now those are the people he's writing to, remember the reason he's writing to them, unto you therefore, unto you in the light of what I just said, in the, in the, unto you in the light of verse 6, which believe you are faithful, he's precious. He's not the same thing to people who don't believe in him and who hate Christianity and all things pertaining there too. But to you, he's precious. But notice who he's not precious to. But to them which be disobedient. The stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. It's always amazed me and still does that a law that was given to a people to bring them to a certain point and they had 1,500 years to be under it and benefit from it, that when it comes to that point it was leading them to, they failed. And that's what happened with a great many of the Jews regarding the law of Moses. God's schoolmaster brings them to Christ. It brought, it brought them to Christ. There he is, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John declares it, doing the things he did. Yet they rejected him. But now here's what's interesting. Like I said earlier concerning verse 6, it didn't change things. It didn't change things at all. It's what God intended to accomplish through Christ and even his suffering and his death. It was all set up to be that way. And the Jews themselves acted accordingly. And even those that put him to death still would have the opportunity to be saved by him. All the thinking of taking the Lord's Supper of those men who stood around and divided up what little he had of a material nature and then cast lots rather than tear up his outer cloak because it was woven in one scene. There they were busy about that. And they didn't want to tear that uh, mantle he had because it was woven in one scene. They didn't mind what they did to him because they'd already nailed nails in his hands and all sorts of things. And yet he was dying for them too. So it is that you see the, the Apostle Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, when he opposes Stephen, the first martyr, and holds the clothes of them stone Stephen. Later on, he would believe and obey the gospel and be, as far as we know, the greatest of faithful servants of God for what Jesus called him to do. I was visiting with a brother there so ago, and I was mentioning this, and it's crossed my mind a lot of times. Wouldn't it be something to have been in glory to see Paul enter into the Hadean world and meet Stephen and then think when the last time they met? And yet here, Paul would meet one who he had been against, who opposed, who gave his vote against him, who even held the clothes of those who stoned him to death. And now they're to the air together in paradise. Well, these kind of things need to be on people's minds that they're going to be faithful to the Lord. And so, unto you, therefore, which believe he's precious, and to them which be disobedient, the stone which the builder has disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And notice, to the disobedient, notice, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. 
even to them which stumble at the word. Now watch, how do they stumble at the word? We've all been going through the house at night and turn the lights on, stumble over something or stumble over a root out the yard or something. But how do they stumble? These that Peter addresses. They stumble when they're disobedient, which stumble at the word being disobedient. Whereunto also they were appointed. Now that's interesting. Whereunto also they were appointed. Now there'd be people jump on this and say, see, they had no choice. God foreordained and predestined before the world was that they would uh, be disobedient. That's not what they said. People who have a disposition of mind not to love the truth are not apt to obey the truth from the heart, such as Romans 6. 17 and 18 indicates people did and all have who had become Christian. They were predestined, if you please. They were appointed. They were ordained to do so because of their own disposition of mind. You could say that about Pharaoh of old regarding the release of the children of Israel and it from Egyptian bondage. That's the reason it can say that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And God hardened his heart. All three are true. Pharaoh rejected the obvious evidence in the miracles done in the plagues of Egypt that this says, listen to what Moses said. God is speaking through him concerning his desire for the children of Israel. But it didn't work. And in rejecting those things, he hardened his heart. That ought to be a great warning to all of us. But all we have to do to harden our hearts, our inward man, to make our intellects not work that God created to work and to not think straight or logically with the truth is to simply not do what God tells us to do. And that's those are the people that prepare their minds that are appointed to uh, disobedience. They prepare their mind to be disobedient. You know, you have to pre prepare your mind to be obedient. And James says that we ought to, with meekness, receive the engrafted word of God. That means you recognize it for the authority that it is in declaring the truth, and you approach it that way. So you prepare yourself to be obedient, or you prepare yourself to be disobedient. Now think about it for a moment. That's all you can do in this life. Is either prepare yourself to be obedient to your God. As he reveals himself in his, in his word. The Bible. And declares what we need to believe and do. Or. We stumble. Because we don't want to do what God said in the first place. Now if you go back over and read Romans chapter 1. You'll see back early on, as it tells about the majority of the Gentiles down through history, up to the time Paul wrote the Roman epistle, that they desired not to retain God in their knowledge. Well, we must realize that one time everybody knew God existed. Everybody understood the outer obeying. But there came a time when people didn't desire to keep him in their mind. And thus he gave them up to do all those wicked things that had become commonplace in the Roman Empire in the way of false religions and immorality. So we must either prepare ourselves a love of the truth, proper respect for God's authority to obey the truth, or we will prepare ourselves to reject it. And there's a host of people, in fact, the sad part about it is, most people who are accountable to God for their beliefs and actions are not seeking after God. That's why Matthew 6.33 is so important. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things should be added unto you. Now, notice as you go into verse 9. But in contrast to these who are appointed to because of their bad attitude toward God, not wanting to obey him, and stumble at the word. What are you? You Christians to whom I'm writing, you who are suffering for the cause of Christ, you who may have to die because you're Christians. You're, you're chosen 
generation. You're a royal priesthood and holy nation. A peculiar people. The American Standard 1901 says, a people for God's own possession. That ye should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look at the contrast. Many of these people could remember the time that they would have been out in the world living like all the rest of the Gentiles or unbelieving Jews. But not now. Why not now? Because they've heard the gospel. They believed it. They've obeyed it. They changed their lives by obeying the truth. But may I mention again here the only way you're going to change your way of thinking and thus your way of living is by obedience to the truth. That's what changes you. Then he says, well, let's look at this just a little further before we leave that verse. The people for God's own possession, the word peculiar in the King James doesn't mean strange bunch. Now, compared to the worldly crowd, we might use our modern meaning of peculiar and say Christians are peculiar, but that's not what it's meant here. Peculiar in the King James comes from pecuniary. It means a purchased people, a, God, a people for God's own possessions, the American Standard renders it. So what he's saying is you're where you are because God has purchased you through Jesus Christ and the blood which purchased the church, Acts 20 and 28. The blood shed for the remission of sin, of our sin. Our sins are remitted when from the heart we obey the gospel of Christ. Romans 6, 3 and 4 and 17 and 18. So another thing that comes out, a chosen generation. How were we chosen? This harkens back to the fact that there was a fleshly Israel, which was the shadow of the church or spiritual Israel to come. Well, we were chosen. By the gospel, we were chosen when we humbly heard the truth and accepted it. Look at the Jews who were Jews by nature on the day of Pentecost. As Peter preached to them along with the other apostles, Christ was proven to them to be the Son of God. The charge had been made to them by Peter. Ye have taken him with wicked hands, had crucified and slain him. Well, they actually pricked in their heart. Their conscience got after them in a big time way. And they cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Evidence is their belief in the message that faith had come to them by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, what happens? He takes them as believers and declares to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Well, I'd stop there, but uh, try to get the idea of the way that Peter describes these people that they need to think about for their own good while their faith is being put to the test through persecution. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this time together. We're thankful for the good message we heard earlier concerning the great word of God that is thine and how thou hast preserved it in thy providential care. We pray that we'll spend more time studying it, meditating on it, reviewing our life in the light of it, preparing ourselves to teach it and defend it. We're thankful for everyone here this evening. Pray for a good night of rest. Keep us, preserve us, for thy eternal kingdom. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.